Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's COVID-19 update. Uh, to date, Australia has had 6,661 confirmed cases of coronavirus COVID-19. We've had uh, uh, continued to have a, a low number over the past 24 hours of only 12 new cases diagnosed. Tragically, 75 lives of Australians have been lost to coronavirus disease. We have performed 458,000 tests uh, since the epidemic started in Australia. In terms of our current capacity to treat patients in need of critical care, we have 48 patients in intensive care units around Australia and 30 of those are on ventilators, helping them breathe. And certainly that is a very challenging time uh, for their friends and family. So we certainly acknowledge that today. Uh, I'd like to just reflect on a conversation I had today uh, with all of the, uh, many of the surgical subspecialty heads uh, in association and collaboration with the president of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, Mr. Tony Sparnan. And that conversation was had in light of uh, the recent government announcement to lift some of the restrictions on elective surgery. And I just wanted to uh, pay tribute to that group in particular for their collaborative approach uh, across all the sectors that they deal with, but approach that has fundamentally been about the welfare of their patients and restoring a care in a safe and equitable way in this very challenging environment that we face ourselves in, uh, looking uh, to demonstrate to the public that our hospitals are safe places again for elective surgery. So I'd like to thank the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons in particular, along with our anaesthetists and our operative nurses and the other peak groups that I've had the privilege of being able to discuss this really important uh, policy change over the uh, coming weeks. I'd like to thank patients and families as well who have been waiting for elective surgery for their patients. Uh, we will be moving together slowly and cautiously over the next month to look at the impact on our health system capacity of reintroducing uh, some level of elective surgery procedures. And we're going to be monitoring the impact of that uh, and one of the ways we're going to be monitoring that has been announced today by the Health Minister in a joint press release with myself. We uh, have, and National Cabinet has uh, agreed, that we require um, a real-time information system that we can monitor intensive care beds across the country. This is called uh, the Critical Health Resource Information System, otherwise known as CRIS, and that system uh, is live now and there are many sites around Australia that are reporting. One of the unique aspects of that is that it will allow us to see how many patients in real time uh, have COVID-19, are on ventilators, importantly how many beds are available, how many beds are being occupied um, by patients with COVID and also non-COVID um, related conditions. Uh, and the reason why that's important is because as we move into resuming elective surgery, some patients will require intensive care after, after their surgery, and we will be able to see what the impact of that policy um, change and that relief on the restrictions of elective surgery uh, will be. Also, that system will bring together public and private uh, data reporting systems, which makes it a very unique and novel system. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Victorian government's support of this, uh, Ambulance Victoria, and in particular the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care Society, uh, all those groups and others have collaborated extraordinarily quickly uh, to bring that up and running and online. I'll take some questions. There are reports uh, emerging overseas that patients who have died from the coronavirus have died because of blood clotting. Is that something that's been reported here in Australia and is that something that health authorities in Australia are looking into? I think as we learn more and more about coronavirus disease, it's, it's critical that we take these reports on board and use them to the best uh, of, of um, our clinicians' ability to inform the uh, treatment of patients in Australia. I'm not aware of that being a complication. Clots in the legs going to the lungs are a known complication of people being unwell with sepsis and being in intensive care for a long period of time. So whether it's specifically due to the coronavirus disease or just because of how 
uh, unwell people get with it. I suspect we will get more of that information as time goes on. So I don't suppose you can tell us how many people who've died from coronavirus in Australia died because of respiratory problems versus blood clotting? So we do have data collection systems for intensive care, as I've just mentioned, but there are also underpinning that several centres, a smaller number, but contribute to overall uh, intensive care research and, and the reasons why, um, tragically, people have died. So that is not information that's obtained in real time, as you can, you can understand. It's, a, it's different, it's not operational, it's research-based, uh, but that sort of information as and when it is researched and analysed would be presented um, by the researchers. I might just take another quick question. Uh, considering how low cases, new cases are at the moment, are, how close are we to actually eradicating COVID-19? And is that now the aim rather than just suppression, actual eradication? Well, the aim, is, as we've, we've said, is suppression. The reality is that we are doing an extraordinary job. We as the uh, Australian community is doing an amazing job uh, in that suppression strategy to the extent that, as you all know, there are some uh, states that have reported uh, zero new cases for several days now. So uh, eradication, which basically means that in a geographical area there are no reported cases or you've effectively uh, eliminated coronavirus from a geographic area, uh, could be an outcome of an excellent su suppression strategy. The problem is that we just have to acknowledge the non-immune state of our population and the possibility, as we have seen in northwest Tasmania, of how rapidly uh, coronavirus can spread. And that might be in a healthcare facility or it might be within um, another part of the community where people are um, closely housed together. We have to be particularly attentive to our um, indigenous communities in Australia. And so for all those reasons, I think we are on a strategy of suppression. Uh, a magnificent outcome would be um, geographic eradication in certain parts of Australia. Is there, a, is yes, there a, a threshold at which point a suppression strategy becomes a, a, an eradication strategy? Is there kind of a levelling up? Or uh, what I'm taking from your question is that we'll always be on the suppression level especially because our non-immune communities like remote communities? I suppose the best way to answer your question is when does a suppression strategy become an eradication strategy? And that would be when the disease is eradicated in a geographic area. Claire. Dr. Caseworth, your colleague, Professor Brennan Murphy, this morning told a Senate inquiry that small gatherings are being considered among some of the measures that might have restrictions eased in three weeks' time, but that large gatherings very much were not. Are we to take that to mean things like weddings and other major events are definitely a long way off for Australia? Well, we, we've seen what happens when large numbers of adults gather together. Uh, there have been a number of major clusters that we're, we're all aware of. Some of those have been related to, to weddings. Uh, and so the, the way to take things slowly is to increase numbers slowly. And, and so that is exactly what Professor Murphy said this morning. And you can infer from that then that larger gatherings are a, long, a, a longer way off. And that would include having crowds at sporting matches, for example, as well as, as, well as weddings. But the number of people that we could have at, in, at events is something that would be considered quite rightly in the first tranche of, uh, of restrictions. And he also flagged that community sport was an area that had particular benefit health-wise, mental health, to re restarting as soon as possible. Would the AHPBC be looking at giving very prescriptive instructions to sporting organisations of how to socially distance? How would they be assisted to apply those measures? Well, if we did take community sport as an example, uh, then we would absolutely need to provide, uh, I suspect, more detailed guidance. Uh, I think the guidance that we've provided at the moment is very clear in terms of social distancing and individual cough hygiene, etc. that Australians know so well, and it is working. But similar to the advice that we've put out on schools, um, where there is a specific uh, uh, demand or need for advice, um, then the HPPC is prepared to provide that advice in some degree of detail. The Prime, on the, um, the tracing up, the Prime Minister said
says he wants 40% of the Australian population to download that app for it to be successful. Is that the sort of um, take-up rate that you would like to see? And if that doesn't happen, are health authorities looking at other methods of expanding contact tracing if the app isn't successful? Well, I think we just need to walk back to the purpose of the app and, and consider also what we have at the moment, which is, which is a, an excellent and robust uh, contact tracing mechanism that's done manually. But you've got to remember that uh, not everybody's memory is perfect for who they've been in contact with for the past, for the past, 14, for the past 21 days. Um, for, sorry, for the past 14 days. Uh, so the app actually assists those disease detectives in determining who was at risk uh, by effectively providing a memory aid uh, so that, that no one is, is missed, so to speak. Now, uh, we also remember that that is data that is locally controlled on someone's mobile phone and is only released. So there's two levels of consent here. Firstly, someone has to download the app to participate. And secondly, uh, when you're call if you are called by a public health authority to say you have COVID-19, you then have to release that local data um, to the state uh, jurisdiction that's responsible for you. The Commonwealth will not be looking at that data at all. It'll be for state public health authorities. So in answer to your question about 40%, the more the better, the more the better. And I think that as we are able to explain to Australians the narrow scope of this, the very singular scope, and reassure them that every time um, someone comes to us and asks us to put an ad in onto that app, the answer is no. And the Attorney General, I think, was very clear this morning when he said that the police, for example, would have no access to the data of this. And there have been requests. There have been requests to have added capability to the app, and the answer has been absolutely consistent. This is for the d disease detectives only. And is there a timeline or a date that you would like to see uh, that 40% target or, or potentially more achieved? I think we should see what happens with the rollout. Um, but I, I have to say, I, I am confident that um, just as Australians have adapted so well um, to uh, COVID-19, this has been an astonishing behavioural change in a short period of time. Uh, I think they will also see the value of having this app as well. What would be the Rich. benefits of the World Health Organisation having similar powers to um, weapon inspectors? and being able to basically go into a country uninvited. And uh, how realistic is that actually happening? Well, you know, the World, the World Health Organization has a really important role to play and in assisting governments around the world in uh, managing disease outbreaks. Uh, how that can be improved upon as a result of this uh, particular pandemic is, as you know, going to be um, the subject of a, a, you know, a lot of lessons learned, um, potentially inquiries, as, as our Prime Minister has suggested. Uh, so I think we don't want to preempt what the results of those uh, would be, except to say that we acknowledge that the World Health Organisation has a really important role to play and we should consider whether its current structures uh, and processes and rules are effective enough to um, pursue that role. The Home Affairs Minister today said that the Director General of the World Health Organization should resign. Um, do you, do you, what do you, do you make of that? I would make of that that there's a, there's a whole uh, range of views in the community at the moment um, that it, it reflects um, the, the deep concern that everybody has about um, this pandemic and the need to do as well as we can uh, next time. One of the problems Australia has had in terms of its own data on COVID is that it's a lot of overseas cases. There hasn't been enough uh, in the community to really get a sense of how the virus spreads. Are we getting to a point yet where we can draw sound scientific conclusions from the cases we've had, or is that base number still too small? We're at the point where we can draw sound scientific ex conclusions about that. Uh, they, uh, my understanding is that um, we will be able to share those at some point in the not too distant future. I, I'm afraid I don't know the exact date, but what I can tell you is that the basic reproductive number, the R, R effective, uh, is below one in every single jurisdiction at the moment, except for Tasmania, obviously, because of the outbreak in Northwest Regional. And because of the amount of time uh, that that's been the case, we can be confident with, the, with that result. Just one last question. Thank you. Um, 
what are you, what's your response to reports that billionaire Kerry Stokes was given an exemption from quarantine rules when he flew into Perth from Aspen, and is that appropriate? I'm afraid I'm not aware of exactly what happened in that scenario, so I'm, I'm not able to comment on it. I'll take one more question, if there is one. Actually. I've exhausted you again. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>